Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Be me, Lizard DM. Be not me, Lizard Folk Fighter, Lizard Folk Cleric, Lizard Folk Sorcerer, Lizard Folk Paladin, Goblin Rogue. Now in the coastal city of Idurkat Point, facing a new world without barren high water, the party finally feel a sense of peace that they hadn't had in a long time. Cleric has given Fighter back the axe. Wux, all but dragging the rogue, is excitedly catching him up on what's happened to the goblin since the day high water attacked. And now we have our own section of the city because people don't like us too much. But that's fine because we don't have to worry about anything hurting us because we're protected by law. The rogue raises his hands in a slow down motion. What about the Grimner Knights? Isn't there at least one here? Wax nods. Yeah, her name is Diana. We don't like her very much but she's fine. We think she doesn't really care that she's being paid by the city to protect it, since nothing happens here. She just sort of, exists, you know? The rogue frowns. She doesn't attack anyone? Wax shrugs. I'm sure she does, but we have more of a, I don't bother you, you don't bother me relationship. Like I said, she's kind of lazy. The rogue nods and turns to the rest of the party, who have no idea what Wax is saying due to them not speaking goblin. There's a grim the knight here. Name's Diana. Not a threat unless we bother her. The fighter frowns. What do if learn high water dead? The rogue pauses. He turns to Wax and recites the question. Wax shrugs. Not sure. She might skip town, find a place to live that suits her better. I doubt she's going to stop everyone from celebrating. Hell, I don't think she'd be able to. Wax leads them through several streets, leading to a separate part of the Durkap Bay. Eventually, they find themselves at a wall, where after a minute of walking around it, they find a small gate. Wax turns and gives a wide gesture with his arms. Welcome to Goblin Town. The party pass through the gate, finding a long street filled with small wooden houses. Well built and cozy looking, these houses seem about the right size for a 3-4 FT person. The rogue is absolutely astonished at this. They gave you all of this? Wax beams. 28 houses. Room for us now and room for more in the future. Sitting in a deck chair outside one of the houses is a younger, pregnant goblin. Wax walks over and gives her a smile. Afternoon Kerry. Look who I found on my stroll by the docks. Kerry looks up at the rogue, holding her hand above her eyes to shield out the sun. Turks? The rogue gives an uncomfortable smile. Hey, you. Kerry raises her eyebrow. You don't remember me? The rogue shakes his head. No of course I remember you. It's just been so long. I didn't recognize your face. Kerry, yes, yeah. Kerry sighs. Your neighbor. My neighbor. That's right. The whole party loses their shit. Kerry looks over his shoulder, seeing the group of lizard folk. Who are they? The rogue turns and signals that they should come forward. These are my friends. They've helped me through a lot of my adventures and are the reason I'm even here in front of you now. The paladin gets on his knee and extends a hand. Carrie takes it. My name is Curate. It's a pleasure meeting you. He gently shakes her hand. She smiles. Carrie. The pleasure is all mine. The fighter steps forward but the rogue quickly jumps forward. This is Chahusk. Then, in Goblin, he adds. He doesn't understand how civilization works. He nearly tore Wax's arm off. Don't shake his hand. Kerry, mildly terrified, gives the fighter an uncertain smile. Hi Chahusk. I'm Kerry. The fighter attempts to give her a smile. If the attempt weren't horrifying enough, he still has pieces of vampire spawn in his teeth and he looks like he came out of a blender. I'm Chahusk. Kerry smiles. UHH. Yes. Yes you are. The fighter looks at the paladin who gives him a thumbs up. The fighter looks at her and leans down, putting his head near her very pregnant stomach. Soon lay egg. 
Kerry, utterly terrified and looking at Wux and the rogue desperately for help shakes her head. But I don't lay eggs. The fighter looks at her and tilts his head. He raises his axe. Something in body. Help get out. The paladin all but tackles him. No. Stop. The fighter looks at him before turning and seeing Kerry's mortified expression. I'm sorry. Without waiting for a response he abruptly walks off. The cleric and sorcerer soon follow him. The rogue looks at the paladin. Can you stay with them to make sure they don't eat anyone? The paladin nods and runs off. Wux and Carrie staring after the lizard folk with looks of confusion and concern. The rogue smiles. Sorry about that. They take a bit of getting used to, but generally they're nice people. They just don't understand sometimes. Kerry nods slowly, eyes never leaving the lizard folk. The rogue spends the rest of the day reuniting with the goblins as they all eventually show up from their days at work. The lizard folk are left watching in confusion at the displays of affection and happy reuniting, as it is very different to what they are normally used to. The paladin does his best to explain what he can to the others, but most just don't get it. The cleric shakes his head. Fleshy's so weird. Sorcerer and fighter nod in agreement. As the sun begins to slowly drift towards the horizon, the rogue is telling the goblins about his and the lizard folk's adventures, showing off his horrific array of neck-based injuries to his astounded audience. The cleric, still with huge gashes in his face, refused treatment from the village healer, insisting that scars are honorable. The night is just beginning to get dark when suddenly, the party hear a huge explosion, followed by the sounds of thousands of cheering people. The party look in the sky, seeing explosions of color and sound. Fireworks, or rather, the magical equivalent. The fighter grabs his axe, the cleric and sorcerer drawing daggers. The rogue looks over at them and stands up. It's fine, they're just celebrating. The cleric frowns. Celebrating? The rogue stares at him. You've never had a party? The sorcerer steps forward. We break in party and zanimate. The rogue looks at him and stares at him blankly. Alright then, it's non-negotiable. I'm taking you guys to a proper party, not some fancy schmancy oh look how rich we are get together. The fighter looks at the axe. Bring axe. The rogue shakes his head. Bring a dagger if you want, but not the axe. We want to seem somewhat approachable, don't we? The rogue looks over at the paladin, who's admiring the fireworks. You coming? The paladin shrugs. I've got nothing better to do. And so the shenanigans began. The party made their way into the booming streets of Idurkav Point, passing several people who were well on their way to being drunk and all celebrating a world without high water. The rogue led them into a tavern, where they found several people already mind-numbingly drunk, singing songs and drinking heartily. The rogue walked up to the counter and asked the bartender for five drinks. The half-orcish bartender looked up from his work scrubbing alcohol off a nearby part of the counter, seeing the rogue, and then the lizard folk. E, ain't you the ones that done killed Highwater? The rogue gives him a smile. Why yes we are. Now please, we wish to celebrate our feet with a drink. The bartender passes him the drinks, refusing the silver the rogue went to pay with. On the house. The rogue thanked him and passed around the drinks. Any of you ever had alcohol? The cleric looks at him. What alcohol? The rogue gets the most sinister look on his face. A drink to make you stronger. It helps you do more than a normal person could. He rolls high on his deception and winks at the paladin. The paladin looks at the group, then back at the rogue. You'd better know what you're doing. They all down their drinks. The cleric and sorcerer immediately spew them back up. The fighter is fine however and seems to enjoy the taste. More strong juice. The rogue gives the paladin an evil grin before returning to the counter. The paladin rolls his eyes and pats the backs of the two heaving lizard folk, who are desperately spitting to get the burning taste out of their throats. The rogue looks up at the bartender. I need a favor. The bartender looks at him and raises an eyebrow. Shoot. The rogue's grin grows even wider. Get me a round of the most evil concoction you can make. I want this guy beyond plastered. The bartender looks at the two spitting lizard folk and the fighter waiting expectantly beside them. He gives a small chuckle. 
You're an evil little man, ya yeah, know that? The rogue gives him a grin. The bartender makes an unholy mixture of pure alcohol and several other ingredients the rogue has never seen before. The rogue gags at the sheer overwhelming smell of it. The bartender leans in. I call this the shot of the abyss. You give it to your mate over there, and he ain't gonna feel right tomorrow morning, the day after, or even the next one. The rogue's smile is beyond evil at this point. He grabs the drink, tossing the bartender two gold coins. One for the drink. One more for the shit storm that's about to go down. The bartender takes it and waves him good luck. The rogue passes the fighter the drink. He made it special. Said this would make a lizard folk as strong as a terrisk. The paladin gets a whiff of the drink and recoils. What in the F King 9 hells is that? The rogue turns to him. An experience like no other. The fighter, without even pausing to smell it, downs it. The rogue takes a step back and smiles at the paladin. Now just step back and watch the magic happen. I ask the fighter to make a con save. 4. He's gone. What happened next I can only describe as insanity. The fighter went on to have several more drinks, try explain to a tabaxi woman why he thought her fur would make a good tent cover, challenge a goliath to a wrestling match, flee from the tavern as he proceeded to tear a piece out of the goliath throat with his teeth, throw a gnome through a grocer's stand, flee from the rest of the party when they tried to stop him, vomit violently in back alleyways, walk around for an hour convinced he was a centaur. Punch a guy after they suggested he wasn't one. Run from the local guards and dive off the roof of a building into a Durkap Bay. It was purely a miracle he wasn't dead by the end of the night. As the morning rose, the rest of the party woke in Goblin Town, the fighter nowhere to be seen. The paladin walked into the rogue's room and shook him awake. Fighter, isn't here. The rogue groaned and rolled over. He had a pretty bad hangover. Of course he's not here. This is my room. I mean he's not in the village. I told you to bring him back. The rogue holds a hand to his temple. Don't be so loud. I've got a headache as it is. The paladin taps him, casting lesser restoration. There. Now go find him. You got him drunk. It's your responsibility to bring him back. The rogue sighs but not, getting to his feet and wandering out of goblin town. He wanders around a dirk at point aimlessly. Asking anyone he meets if they've seen the fighter. Most people are hungover, and some are sleeping in the street. It seems that the people of Adirka point party hard. He's walking for about two hours when he finally finds the fighter. Lying under a bridge, passed out, a half-elf in a state of undress draped over his chest. The rogue gives a long sigh and walks over, tapping her. She stirs awake and looks at him. What you want Jublin? She slurs. I'm getting my friend back. You should probably get out of here. She looks down, as if realizing for the first time that she was lying on him and that her clothes were partially off. Oh god, I didn't did I? The rogue shrugs. She holds her head and groans. Not again. She looks up at the rogue. You'd better not tell anyone about this. The rogue shrugs again. She gets up and gathers her clothes around her, unsteadily walking off. After making sure she leaves alright, he turns to the fighter. The rogue goes to shake him awake but decides that disturbing a drunk lizard folk while an easy biting range isn't the best idea. He grabs a nearby pebble and takes a few steps back before throwing at him. The rock hits the fighter's head and he growls, cracking open an eye. The fighter looks at him and tries to roll over onto his stomach. After failing his first attempt, he tries again and groans as he rises to his knees. Why no feel good? The rogue hides a smile. The drink gives you lots of strength, but it can make you feel bad afterwards. The fighter tries to stand up but falls over, his balance shot to hell. The rogue walks over and holds out a hand. The fighter takes it and tries to stand up again, using the rogue as a thing to lean on. The rogue gets a whiff of his breath and nearly gags. The fighter's teeth are coated in blood, likely from the Goliath last night, and his breath smells like a horrible mixture of alcohol and decaying flesh. What do last night? The rogue, struggling immensely from the weight of his friend, sighs. I don't know. You went pretty wild. 
The fighter nods and begins stumbling towards the pier, where he begins looking down at the water. The rogue stands next to him, patting him on the back uncomfortably as the fighter proceeds to empty his stomach into the water. After a solid two minutes of vomiting, the fighter wipes his mouth and slowly climbs to his feet. He begins walking unsteadily towards the end of the pier. The rogue grabs his arm, concerned for his welfare. Which is when the fighter stumbles towards the edge, quickly grabbing onto the rogue to try stop himself from falling. It doesn't work, and only serves to drag the rogue into the water with him. Several hours after he left, the rogue returns to Goblin Town, smelling of alcohol and seawater. He's soaking wet and red-faced from a mixture of anger and embarrassment. The fighter follows sheepishly behind him, his walking pattern slightly more normal. The paladin walks over, casting lesser restoration. The fighter thanks him before walking over to a small fountain and dipping his head in it, drinking as much water as his body can take. The rogue shakes his head. It's stuff like that that makes me wonder if I really am making a mistake in traveling with lizard folk. The paladin shrugs. Where do you find him? Under a bridge. The paladin nods, as if accepting that as completely normal. The cleric walks over. When leave. The rogue's face falls. But we only just got here. The cleric tilts his head. What mean? Arrive here yesterday. The rogue pauses. But I've only just gotten back with my people. I don't want to go so soon. The paladin puts a hand on his shoulder and turns to the cleric. We'll stay here for a week or two so, rogue, can be with his people. Then we'll go where you want, okay? The cleric nods and walks off. The rogue looks up at the paladin. You'll stay here for me? The paladin shrugs. It's a nice place and I'm sure we can find something to do while you reconnect for a while. The rogue nods. Thank you. Rogue player looks at me. We are going to have time to have a break, right? I give him a small smile but say nothing. Only time will tell. Game ends. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Be me, Lizard DM. Be not me, lizard folk fighter, lizard folk cleric, lizard folk sorcerer, lizard folk paladin, goblin rogue. Party are currently in Idurkat Point, a coastal city northwest of Noxvakeep. After a crazy night, the party have agreed to stay in the city for two weeks, giving the rogue time to reconnect with his people and the others to have a little downtime before they make their way back to the swamp to report their mission's success. We start the game with a simple question. You have two weeks. What do you want to do? The rogue immediately says he wants to spend time with his people. The fighter turns to the cleric. You don't have any more diamonds, do you? Cleric shakes his head. Fighter turns back to me. I'm going to spend these two weeks earning money to buy diamonds. We'll come back to him shortly. The sorcerer decides he wants to explore the city and perhaps learn more about this Diana person. Before the cleric can speak, the paladin turns to him. Cleric, I have a favor to ask. What favor? You do something kind for me, and I'll do something kind for you when you ask. The cleric nods. What want? The paladin gives a pause. I want to learn draconic. The cleric tilts his head. Why? Paladin looks a bit uncomfortable. I, I think, when we reach the swamp, I want to feel, just once, like I belong with the people. I don't want them to know I'm different. The cleric nods. I teach draconic. And so, in this small section of this coastal city, the cleric begins to teach him. The paladin learns quickly, but even so, it takes him the entirety of the two weeks to become even somewhat skilled in speaking the language and he struggles immensely with the written language. 
Sometimes goblins would come around and listen in on the languages, and although some tried to take notes, none had the sheer capacity for learning that the paladin possessed. Meanwhile, the fighter was looking for a job. With no prior experience in the job seeking department, he had no idea how to go about getting one. He walked into a butcher and went up to the counter. Need money. The dwarvish butcher stared at him. Ain't you the guy that went wild last night? The fighter nods. Need money. Yeah, sorry pal, I haven't got a job here for you, try somewhere else. The fighter nods and leaves, finding himself in a bookstore. He repeats the process. Need money. The Nomish bookstore owner looks at him and frowns. You need a job? Yes. Job. Well, do you have any experience in the business? The fighter looks at the books around him. Can fight. Kill high water. She raises an eyebrow. Congratulations, but that wasn't what I was asking. I'm good manners. I'm sure you have good manners, but quite frankly, unless you have the skills necessary, I can't offer you a job here. The fighter nods and goes to leave the store, nearly bumping into another gnome on his way out. This gnome is younger and has a heavily bandaged arm. As they meet eyes, the gnome shrieks. I don't want no trouble sir. The fighter frowns. Move fleshy, and leave. The gnome nods fast and all but dives out of the way. The fighter leaves, already forgetting the injured gnome. He tries store after store, always being turned away. After nearly two hours, he continues to roam the streets, until eventually, he hears the sound of clashing metal and yelling. He follows the sounds, eventually finding a large crowd. He pushes his way through and sees a small rectangular pit with a spectator's fence around it. One side is sand, probably to make a softer fall, the other leading into the ocean. As he watches, he sees a human swing a sword at a tiefling, who deftly grabs his arm and perfectly hip throws him to the ground. The crowd goes nuts as the tiefling proceeds to pound his face in until finally, someone runs in and separates the two. As the fight ends, the fighter sees people passing around coins. Bets most likely. It's a fighting pit. He turns to a half orc next to him, who's standing next to one of his buddies and mimicking punching him. He taps him on the shoulder, and the half orc turns. What you want lizard man? Why they fight? The half orc turns to his buddy before turning back to the fighter. Mate, this is the bloody fighting pit of a dirk at point. Best fighters from the city and beyond gather here to prove their mettle. Each win gets them a bit more cash and we get to watch. It's great. Fighter frowns. Fight money? The half orc nods. Yeah, and they can do it every day for a month every year. You get some guys with serious grudges against each other. I mean, you just missed this fight between these two guys. One got the other to tap and then when some fans started booing, the F King jumped out of the pit and started fighting the crowd. It was insane dude. Fighter, how enter. The half orc looks him up and down before shrugging. He points to a small tent on the other side of the pit. Officials are over there. You give your details, they tell you the rules and let you choose a weapon from their list. Fighter thanks him and begins making his way over to the tent. He enters it, seeing the human from the last fight lying on a medical table his more serious wounds being taken care of by a healer. A dwarf looks up at him and smirks. You wanna fight lizard man? Want money? The dwarf smirks. They all do. Come on over, put in your details. The fighter fills out the credentials and a few elves begin giving him a physical inspection, ensuring that he isn't concealing any weapons. Not that there's any way he could hide any. The dwarf waits until they're finished until speaking again. Okay, the rules are simple. Two fighters go into the pit with a weapon they choose. You win by either forcing someone to submit, knocking them out or killing them. The last one isn't suggested, because the mayor barely lets us operate as it is, and he told us that if any more people end up dying because we don't have enough healers to revive them, we'll get shut down. Fighter nods and follows several other processes. Finally, he ends up being put in a line. Several other prospective fighters wait in line too. Most of them have scars and are bulky, like they're used to fighting. 
An official splits them into two groups and coordinates fights based on respective sizes. The fighter is put into a line and is about to be organized into a fight until he catches the gaze of a Goliath glaring at him. The Goliath has a long series of scars on his throat, where it looks like someone haphazardly stitched it back together. The Goliath goes to the official and passes him a coin, nodding in the fighter's direction. The official nods and subtly pockets the coin. The Goliath gives the fighter a grin and places a thumb to his throat, dragging it across in a slicing motion. The fighter has no clue who he is and thinks this is some weird ritual by Goliaths. Eventually, it's his turn to go into the pit. He looks at a rack of weapons, most of which seem covered in the blood of past combatants. After a moment, he grabs a spear. The Goliath, seeing this, grabs a huge great axe and gives him a growl. The fighter enters the ring, moving towards the side with the water. As he looks into the water, he can see another fence down there, and what looks like another group of spectators. Tritons. He shrugs, looking back at the Goliath who growls at him. I'm going to rearrange your face lizard man. The fighter frowns. No makes sense. A bell sounds and the Goliath dashes forward, swinging his axe wildly. The fighter dodges out of the way and stabs the spear forward, piercing the Goliath's leg. The Goliath swings at him and follows through by adding a push kick. The kick hits the fighter in the chest, who is sent to the ground. The fighter gets back up and throws a spear, which embeds itself in the Goliath's chest. He sprints forward, grabbing the spear and punching the Goliath in the jaw with the other hand. The Goliath smiles and grabs the fighter by the wrist of his spear hand, slowly wrenching it to the side. He then grabs the axe and slams it into the fighter's exposed shoulder. The fighter growls and grabs his arm, biting into it. As soon as the grip loosens, he pulls his arm free and stabs the Goliath in the foot. The Goliath yanks the axe out and goes to swing it at his head, which the fighter easily dodges. The fighter smashes the Goliath in the knee before stabbing into the other with the head of the spear. The Goliath falls to the ground. The Goliath goes to get up and swing. Nat 1. He stumbles and falls back to the ground. The fighter gets behind him and loops the shaft of the spear around his throat, using his arms to block the arteries on the sides of his neck. He tightens the choke, using his legs and tail to keep him on the Goliath's back. After a failed attempt to get him off, the Goliath finally crumples to the ground, unconscious. The crowd is silent for a moment before going insane. Meanwhile, the sorcerer is exploring the city, taking note of the layout and significant buildings. He spends about an hour simply observing before he has an idea. He walks to a nearby store vendor. Hello, can help find Diana? The vendor, a half-elf man raises an eyebrow. You're looking for Diana? Now why the hell would you go and do something like that? The sorcerer shrugs. I'm looking for her, need find. The vendor, clearly not willing to deal with this shit, sighs. If she hasn't skipped town already, you should find her in Kern Hallow's tavern. Small place, in an alleyway with a covering, so it's never in full sun. Try south side of the city. The sorcerer thanks him and goes off to find Diana. After about an hour of searching, he finds the alleyway in question. Even just looking at it, he can tell it isn't the place people go walking down if they want a fun time. It just radiates that vibe of I'm going to get shanked in here. Ignoring this, he walks down it, looking for the tavern. After getting a lot of shifty looks, he finds it. A tiny place, it's crammed in between two buildings and seems more like a space filler than an intended construction. He steps inside, his eyes having to get used to the sudden candle light. It's surprisingly busy, though, besides one table, every place is only occupied by one or two people. The group in question are a pack of about 8 dwarfs, all huddled close and talking quietly. They eye the sorcerer off as he enters but quickly return to their hushed conversation. He looks around the room, seeing only 3 noticeably female people. One is a dwarf in the group. The other two are half elves, both sitting and talking. The sorcerer walks up and stands beside them. Is one you Diana? Both turn to him. One girl, who appears slightly younger goes pale as she sees him and her eyes widen. The other one places a hand on her arm and says something quietly to her in Elvish. 
The woman seems to calm down, but she still can't seem to look the sorcerer in the eye. The other turns to him, raising an eyebrow. Who's asking? Me. The woman sighs. Yes, I can see that, but who are you? I'm Draws. She sighs again, seeing she really isn't getting anywhere with this. What do you want? He frowns. You Diana? Yes I'm Diana, now F King get on with it. He pulls his head back from the sudden aggression. You grim the knight. Diana nods. The sorcerer sits down next to the other girl. The girl goes red and shuffles her chair away. Diana sighs and turns to her. Can you stop? You're making a scene. But what if he knows? It doesn't matter. You didn't do anything, and the guy probably won't remember a thing. It's your fault for getting so drunk anyway. The woman shrinks into her seat further. Diana turns back to the sorcerer. What do you want? High water dead. Want talk. Diana rolls her eyes. You know, I really didn't notice. Perhaps the two dozen people trying to kill me last night wasn't a good enough notification. Perhaps I had to get blood all over one of my favorite dresses for nothing. The sorcerer frowns, but says nothing. She rolls her eyes again. What do you want to talk about? Need no information. She raises an eyebrow. About what? About Grim the Knight. What do now High Water Dead? She shrugs. Leave their towns before someone kills them most likely. Might take over Noxva Keep, I dunno. What you do? Diana shrugs. I'm going to finish up having a drink and when the sun goes down I'll move south. Probably find some forest town or something. She raises an eyebrow. Unless you have something to say about that? The sorcerer shrugs. I kill high water. And if you had said that a couple months ago I might have given a shit. The sorcerer nods. Why some grim the knight no care? She shrugs. I don't know about the others, but I didn't have much of a choice in becoming like I am. Quite frankly, as soon as I figured out that he didn't have the time to come and check up on all of us, I stopped caring. I reckon that was his key mistake. He made too many of us. Not many people like being undead. It has its perks, but not being able to go into the sun is definitely a downside. She gestures to her skin. I mean, look at me. When I was younger I used to sit on the sand and enjoy the sun. I had a great tan. Now I can't even go outside during the day without becoming a pile of dust. Something like that might cause a bit of resentment. The sorcerer nods. Diana grabs her drink and finishes it off. Now, if you don't mind, we were talking, and we'd like to continue doing so without being interrupted. The sorcerer nods and leaves. The players in Goblin Town are going about their days, the rogue telling stories and enjoying living as a normal goblin at least for a little bit and the cleric teaching the paladin draconic. The fighter comes back daily absolutely littered with scars and bruises, occasionally missing teeth and always with a small bag of coins. The cleric and paladin heal him up, and he gives them the money, suggesting they use it to buy diamonds. His work in the pit is paying him well, and in the short time he's spent there, he's become a crowd favorite. The sorcerer has spent a lot of his time exploring and learning information that interests him. He knows that Idurkap Point was built as a trade port between land goers and a city of tritons deeper in the ocean and has spent a bit of time trying to figure out how he might feasibly get down there. On the last day of their visit, the party is preparing to leave. The fighter cancelled his deal with the pit fights, much to the disappointment of the spectators. The rogue was saying his goodbyes when it happened. The ground begins to shake violently, a distant sound of rumbling growing louder and louder. The buildings themselves begin to shake, and several goblins sprint out of a house just before it collapses. The sounds of screams in the city echoes above the rumbling. After nearly a minute of destruction and distant screams, the rumbling finally ceases and a few seconds later, the ground stops shaking. The city is in chaos. Several buildings have collapsed, people are taking cover, and others still are running around wildly, asking what the hell is going on. The party leave Goblin Town and the fighter immediately runs over to a collapsed house, where an old man is attempting to lift a piece of debris off a small girl. The fighter lifts it and the man scoops her into his arms, holding her tight as she cries. 
the party see a group of people staring in at the sky, all looking south. They follow suit, their eyes widening as they see it. A huge plume of black smoke billows into the sky, and even now, ash is falling from the sky. The sorcerer sees that same group of dwarfs staring at the sky, holding out their hands as ash falls onto their hands. They turn to the others and begin talking furiously. The sorcerer nudges the rogue and points. The rogue nods and walks over to the group, the lizard folk in tow. What's happening? The dwarfs turn to him. None of your business goblin. The rogue gestures around him. Ash is falling from the F king sky, I think that's kind of my business. If you ain't gonna tell us what we want to know, we have other ways of getting the information from you. The dwarf talking looks at him and then the lizard folk behind him. You're too young. You won't get it. The rogue rolls his eyes. Try me. The dwarf points to the plume of smoke. That's Desaria. It's been cold for centuries because we shut down the forge there. That explosion means someone restarted the forge without taking the precautions necessary. The rogue looks at me. Would I know what he's talking about? No. What about, Paladin? He's well read. I get the Paladin to roll a straight intelligence check. 11. I take a moment to write a note before passing it. The Paladin reads it and raises his head. The Forge of Desaria is a volcano forge made from the union of the five dwarf tribes. They shut it down after centuries of use, but no one knows why. The fighter turns to the dwarf. Will forge pose threat? The dwarf pauses. Yes. If that forge has been lit again, there's only one reason, and if it's not stopped, all of Isopin is in danger. The paladin turns to the party. Looks like we're not going back to the swamp yet. Game ends. Be me, lizard DM. Be not me, lizard folk fighter, lizard folk cleric, lizard folk sorcerer. Lizard folk paladin, goblin rogue. Party has just witnessed the eruption of Desaria Volcano, an ancient dwarven forge that has been relit. Rogue looks at the dwarf he'd been talking to. What's inside Desaria? The dwarf pauses and looks at the others. The paladin notices that some of them give him a shut up sort of look. He turns back. I don't know. Rogue sighs. Gets ash in his mouth. Begins coughing violently. Fighter slaps him on the back until he stops coughing. Sorcerer holds out his hand and casts Gust, clearing the air around them and keeping the ash at bay. Rogue, now red-faced, points a shaking finger at the dwarf. I ain't in the mood for this shit. Tell me what's in the forge that's so dangerous. The dwarf shakes his head. I never went inside. I was a child when it went cold. Rogue pauses. Who would know? The dwarf shrugs. Any dwarf older than 450. Paladin. Just dwarf. What about elves or other long living races? The dwarf shifts his eyes to the side in obvious discomfort. It's UHH, not something other races would know. Cleric points at other dwarfs. Small fleshy old? They look between themselves and shake their heads. Rogue. Okay. Where can we find an older dwarf? I'd rather not have ash fall from the sky for the rest of my life. The dwarf looks like he's about to correct the rogue when suddenly the fighter gives him a dangerous look. UHH, any of the major dwarven cities. Karen, Arden, Garagia, Bestron, take your choice. They're the homes of the dwarf tribes. Fighter frowns. No fifth city. The dwarf frowns. What do you mean? Say five tribes, four cities. No fifth city? Did I say five? I meant four. There are only four tribes. Four cities for four tribes. Party gives him a yeah, sure, sort of look. Party take this knowledge and open the map, having a look. I point out which cities are the dwarven cities in question. The dwarf suddenly clears his throat. We'll be leaving now. We need to get home. Before waiting for a response, the dwarfs hurry off. The party decide not to follow. Fighter. We go dwarf city. Learn threat. Eat threat. Party look at the map and try decide which city to go to. Bestron looks the closest, but that isn't saying much. Cleric points out a key point. Bestron and Arden close Noxva keep. 
He isn't wrong. Traveling to either city would take them back in the direction of Noxva Keep. Idurkav Point is in the northeast corner of Isopin, closer to the swamp than any of the dwarven cities. Sorcerer finally points to Guragia. If travel Guragia, move south, learn good, get close. Fleshy translation, if we go to Guragia, we'll be able to keep moving south towards Desaria, while still getting the information we need. Party agree. Skipping over a lot of debate for the sake of time, the party pool their money not spent on diamonds and hire a wooden cart and two horses. Just as the party go to leave, Wax, coated in ash, runs up to the rogue, pushing some coins into his hands. Accept this gift. We've only spent a small time together, and you're already going back into the world to save us from danger. Let us help you in what little way we can. Rogue accepts the gift and wishes Wax well. The cleric casts speak with animals and animal friendship on the horses. Everyone piles into the cart and the horses begin leading it away, without the need for anyone to be on the reins. Not like anyone being over there would have helped. The world, with ash falling from the sky, is a colorless blur of white and grays. The party look like reptilian ghosts, except the rogue, who's hardly distinguishable from the cart. The rogue looks at the sorcerer and gestures to his body. Can you, UHH, do that thing you did before to me? The sorcerer nods and raises his hand. Costs gust. The rogue holds out his hands as a sudden blast of wind rockets towards him. The ash flies off of him, and he gives a grin, his ears flapping in the wind. His grin fades as he realizes he's sliding along the cart. He gives a yelp as he falls out and is covered in an even thicker layer of ash. He begins sprinting after the cart and eventually climbs back inside. Sorcerer tilts his head and raises his hand. Do again? The rogue, unsure if blasting him out of the cart was intentional, looks at him with suspicion. He grabs onto the fighter's tail for support and then nods. Sorcerer blasts him. Although some ash still clings determinedly to his clothing and hair, he's relatively clean. Even still though, ash keeps on falling. Rogue points above his head and casts Tensor's floating disc. It acts as an invisible umbrella. He has an idea and also casts Mage Hand, using his ability to make it invisible to hold it in front of one of the horse's eyes so that it won't be blinded by the ash. They travel for an hour, the sorcerer casting gust every few seconds to clear the air around them and away from the horses. The disc has been gathering a large pile of ash. And as the hour ends, I ask the rogue to make a dex save with disadvantage, he's sitting down. He frowns and does so. 4. He yells out as the disc dissipates and a mountain of ash falls onto him all at once. Sorcerer raises his hand but the rogue stops him. He climbs out of the pile and grabs onto the fighter's tail again. Sorcerer blasts him. Rogue, hair now ruffled sufficiently, sits back down and resets the disc knowing now to occasionally tilt it to let ash fall off the side of the cart. The party travels south for three days undisturbed. With each passing day, the land gets colder. With no exposure to the sun, Isopin isn't warming up during the day. They have no way of telling the progression of the days the ash fall is so heavy. It seems endless, coating Isopin in a layer of dirty white. When the ash finally stops falling, the sky's still left a hazy grey color. It happens slowly, the ash becoming lighter and lighter with each passing hour until finally, it trickled almost out of existence. The party stare at the sky, surprised to find that the blinding fall is finally over. They're about to continue on when they hear the distant sound of shouting voices. They stop the cart and creep forward, their feet leaving deep prints in the ash ground. As they look over a hill, they see the source of the voices. A fight is going on. On one side, are what appears to be a group of around 10 dwarfs, all wielding weapons and huddled close together in a military formation. On the other side are frog-like monsters. Three red smaller red creatures and one large blue one. Slard. As they watch, one of the red slard slashes a dwarf across the chest, who falls to the ground screaming. The slard is beaten back by the other dwarfs, one of which quickly acts to cast a healing spell on the fallen dwarf. The blue slard steps forward, smashing a dwarf aside with its claws before closing its jaws around another's head. 
the dwarfs begin stabbing at it frantically until it is forced to retreat. The party decide they've watched enough. The rogue hits one of the red slard with two crossbow bolts. The paladin runs in, standing in line with the dwarfs. Back up. Who's injured? Pretty much all of the dwarfs give a confirmation. The cleric hits the big guy with a guiding bolt. Fighter runs in, hitting one of the red slard with his axe in the leg. Expends a superiority die to try trip it. It fails its strength save and falls to the ground. He slams the axe down on its chest. Action surge. He turns and slashes at the slard next to him twice. The dwarfs swarm over the down slard and tear into it. It never had a chance. The sorcerer raises his hand, hitting the blue slard and one red slard with a fireball. He realizes that they're resistant to fire. The rogue runs in, slashing at the blue slard with his sword. It looks down at him and emits a deep growl. Ooh, you're much bigger up close. The slard raises its hand and brings it down. The claws tear into him and he lets out a yell as they lacerate him. Constitution saving throw. 2. It brings up its other hand and slams into him, causing his knees to shake from the force. He looks up at it and sneers. Is that all you've got? It puts its jaws over his head and halfway down his arms. The paladin looks over and hefts his axe, slamming it into the side of its head. Second level smite. He swings again. Crit. Another second level smite. The slard lets the rogue go, who falls to the ground, covered in a thick layer of spit. The cleric runs in and casts mass cure wounds. Healing energy radiates from him, washing over the party and the dwarfs. Their injuries close. The fighter proceeds to wail on another red slard, and with the help of the dwarfs, kills that one too. The sorcerer casts second level magic missile. The rogue gets to his feet, his back and knees covered in a mixture of spit and ash. He stabs the slard in the stomach, and it falls onto its back. He stands on top of it. Let this be a message to anyone who wants to bite me. He stabs the slard in the head, impaling its brain. The fight over, the party stand back looking at the dwarfs. One, the apparent leader, steps forward. Thanks for that. I was worried we weren't going to make it there. Paladin, what are you doing out here? The dwarf shrugs. Desaria erupted, we're headed home. To Geragia? The dwarf pauses. Yeah, how do you know? The rogue steps forward, for some reason his wounds haven't closed. Because we're headed there ourselves. We're trying to find out what's in this area so we can stop it. The dwarfs look at each other. You should really focus on finding out who activated the forge. That's the problem, not what's inside. The rogue shrugs. Well then, do you have an idea who might have activated it? I don't imagine many people would know how to. One of the back dwarfs suddenly says something in dwarvish to the one talking. The group begin discussing in dwarvish. The sorcerer looks at me. I'd like to cast comprehend languages. I pass him a note. He casts mage hand and taps the rogue. When the rogue looks over, he taps his ear. The rogue seems to get the idea and casts message. What's up? The small fleshy talk about us. Not know if we know about small fleshies. They talk about deep fleshy. Deep fleshy? That sounds kinda off, but I'll presume you mean dwarf. Deep dwarf. Do they mean Duga? No no Duga. I hear deep tribe. Well, have they said anything about what's inside this area? The sorcerer pauses. I pass him a note. I miss part, but they say god. The dwarfs stop talking and look over at the party. We can only think that a dwarf would know how to, but none would do so. The rogue leans in. Not even Duga? The dwarfs freeze. The leader clears his throat. They may do so, but they are in the underdark, not above land. The rogue shrugs and turns away. Well, we're going to Gugaria to learn stuff. If there's something dangerous in this area, we'll stop it. The dwarf pauses. You won't be able to get into Gugaria. Only dwarfs from the stone tribe are allowed to enter. Cleric, then come. We protect small fleshy, fleshy let us in. The dwarfs look at each other. If you can get us to Gugaria, we'll do our best to get you inside, but there's no promises. The paladin extends his hand. It's a deal then. 
The dwarf shakes his hand. Behind them, they hear a sudden loud snapping. Both turn, seeing the fighter standing over the blue slard, attempting to rip out one of its femurs. The rogue waves his hand before the paladin can speak. Yeah they do that sometimes. Surprise you haven't seen it yet. You'll get used to it. The dwarf, looking disturbed, looks back at the paladin. Name's Dargan. I'm the leader of our war band. We've been serving as mercenaries for a while. An alternative to the Grim the Knights you could say. The paladin nods. My name is Curate. We're the Rising Sun. Dargan pauses. Rising Sun? A few of the dwarfs begin talking amongst themselves. The rogue leans in. You've up heard of us. The dwarf pauses. You're infamous. Hell yeah we are. Rogue realizes what Dargan said. Wait, infamous? Dargan pulls at his collar awkwardly. Yeah, UHH. There's kind of a warrant for your arrest. Paladin, because we killed Highwater? Dargan nods. That and other things. I mean. A group of lizard folk go around, disrupt the local hierarchy and eat people. Kind of gets a bit of attention. The cleric looks at the rogue. What is warrant? People want to put us in jail for killing high water. Cleric shakes his head. Eat fleshy who try. The dwarf step back a bit after hearing that. Rogue winces. Not helping our case here. Paladin. High water was a vampire. The Grim the Knights were his pawn so he could control Isopin. Duggan nods. I believe you. Believe me. Anyone who kills high water deserves to have their names shouted from the rooftops. But others might not. The fact is, most of the population didn't know, and a lot of people would accept cash to bring you in. The rogue pauses and looks at the sorcerer. Are there any more of your kind wandering around? Sorcerer shrugs. Lizard folk no like fleshy. Fleshy no like lizard folk. Lizard folk stay swamp. We scout because have to. The rogue nods. Then we'd better get to Gugaria fast. I don't want to go to jail just yet. Game ends. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.